Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Let me start with some macro thoughts and a tweet from Markets Neil. Got to say this has the appearance of the dollar finally rolling over. We're currently at 97.09 and I think we've got further to fall to around the 94.50 area where there's a lot of buy side support. Home thoughts, this is sunset over the old town of Mombasa, uh, my hometown. That's from Job Artography and it's a lovely photograph. I've never swum where those folks are swimming because uh, of uh, specific reasons, but uh, they're obviously very brave. Um, and uh, we used to live just around the corner from, from there. Sheikh Latif, the transcription of the Bismillah on Mumtaz Mahal Cenotaph in Agra, 1820. That's from William Darimple. The Messier 87 Galaxy, April 10. It might look just a lopsided ring of light, but look closer and you'll see a one-way portal to eternity, the first ever image of a black hole. Um, Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, I like that, a one-way portal to eternity. The Sahara, Morocco, April 7, runners neared the finish line on day one of the six-day marathon de Sable, one of the world's most punishing races, Ryan Christopher Jones for the New York Times. I came across a spectacular article in The Spectator, A River of Lost Souls, The Extraordinary Secrets of the Thames. If you spend enough time on the Thames, you will eventually come across human remains it is a river of lost souls filled with suicides, battles, burials, murders and accidents. With people so poor their families couldn't afford to bury them, or so destitute they were never missed. Their bones wash up on the foreshore in the drifts of smooth honey-brown animal bones the remains of 2,000 years of dining and feasting. In the 15 years I've been chasing the tides, I've found countless coins and buttons, Roman hairpins, a complete Iron Age pot, medieval buckles, Tudor shoes, Georgian wine bottles, and modern wedding rings, but the most sobering are the human finds. A handful of teeth eaten away by rot, a dirty creamy yellow cup, a section of a human skull with faint grooves and ridges on the inside where someone's brain once pressed against it. It is unlikely that the bones I and a fellow mudlark found this summer will ever be identified. We were close to the estuary and had just dropped off the shoreline to begin our trudge across miles of sticky grey mud when my friend saw the skull resting upside down in a shallow dip. Winkles had set up home in its crevices and sinuses and a sprig of bladder rack was growing out of it. A rough skin of barnacles over the rich brown bone showed it had been there some time and close by we found a single long femur and the two lower bones of an arm. All the rest had been washed away. Through Facebook, a specialist in barnacle colonization of human remains from Murdoch University in Perth, Australia, contacted me. If the bones proved to be as old as I thought, she was keen to get her hands on them for further study. A specialist in barnacle colonization of human remains. That's a thought, isn't it? Um, 
and then the same same lady, London mudlark, up with the lark today to catch the morning tide. Pickings were slim, but worth getting out of bed just for the sunrise. I lived in Putney, not far from the river. Like Kipia, Kenya, this is Truth Slinger. It is a wonderful place to visit. This was quite irresistible. Who is that guy? Gucci 1017. Um, a little bit of video. And finally, from Home Thoughts, McLaren F1 Abu Dhabi. Political reflections. Those who are close to the people who wield power will never speak the truth to them. Speaking truth to power is tough. It can only be done by those who want nothing from power. Mahesh N. Bhatt. Then I came across a chap called Dentus Leo. The way a nation creates its wealth determines its political system. In places where natural resources are the main source of wealth, violence is necessary. These places run on a zero-sum game, and thus no reason to cooperate. Natural resources are actually a poisonous gift to any nation, for competition to control the scarce resources calls the worst predatorial behaviours on every layer of the society. On predators, the predator's world works on very simple principles. It's easier to destroy than to build, easier to eat than to cook, to take over than to produce. The predator doesn't need to engage with nature, a necessary complex dialogue that any productive work requires. Like the chess player Nabokov, he focuses on a simplified world and makes an abstraction of everything else. However, the predator can only be effective if he possesses certain qualities. Awareness to spot a prey, speed to beat competition. A nation that bases its wealth on natural resources doesn't have to invest on human development. Money only serves securitarian concerns. No need for an educated population, no need for hospitals, no need for infrastructure. Nations that only have humans as resources have to play differently. The nation needs to invest in its population in order to create wealth. The well-being of the nation resides in its ability to create wealth from knowledge, hence the obligation for cooperation. A nation engaged on the path of cooperative wealth creation finds democracy as naturally as resources-based economies need the securitarian approach. The more ideas it created, the more educated, the richer the nation becomes. Very interesting analysis, I thought. Is this how geopolitics works now? We monitor horse colours. Kate Martin asks. Kim Jong-un rides a white horse again, signalling a more confrontational stance with the international community. And that, of course, his horse is at the Mount Pektu, and I've written about the Mount Pektu bloodline, and also about the fact um, that... Uh, uh, you know, their the cinema is of the highest level, which is no surprise when you consider that Kim Jong-il, the father, was obsessed with cinema and amassed arguably the world's largest personal film collection, over 20,000 bootlegged 35mm screening copies. Kim Jong-il also had a penchant for Hennessy parody cognac, and for two years in the mid-1990s he was the world's largest buyer of Hennessy parody cognac importing up to $800,000 of the stuff a year. Kim Jong-il began his career as the head of the state's propaganda and agitation department and it's clear that Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jong, 
holds the same role and evidently handles all the optics is a chip off the old block. I don't know what happened at Jamia last night. We must be wary of jihadists, Maoists, separatists getting into student protests. That's the finance minister Nirmala Sitaraman um, talking about these events in India where the students have started to revolt against the politics of ethnocratic nationalism. The Chinese Navy is building an incredible number of warships, this is covert shores, whilst the US Navy launches a handful of Aegis destroyers each year. The single image below of a Shanghai shipyard shows nine newly constructed Chinese warships. Uh, the image paints an interesting picture of Chinese naval modernization, yet the biggest takeaway is that this shipyard is not alone. There are many yards across China which are similarly impressive. The Chinese Navy of today and the future is changed beyond all recognition from the Chinese Navy of the past. The world naval balance is shifting. I wrote about China turning 70 on the 7th of October and I was quoting Don DeLillo, longing on a large scale makes history. I went back to the hollow men, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Humans could generate 3.4 billion tons of solid waste by 2050. And Bloomberg is suggesting how countries can prevent a trash apocalypse. Villa del Rosario, Colombia, February 23rd, protesters on the Simon Bolivar Bridge linking Venezuela and Colombia. This is from a series of photographs of the year from the New York Times. Skirmishes erupted after foreign aid trucks were blocked <coughs> by armed loyalists of President Nicola Maduro. That was Meredith Cohut for the New York Times and I wrote about this new economy of anger. Venezuela, where the GDP is down from $350 billion in 2012 to an estimated $60 billion in 2019. And I said, people have been pushed to the edge and are taking to the streets. And I quoted Virilio, the revolutionary contingent attains its ideal form, not in the place of production, but in the street, where for a moment it stops being a cog in the technical machine and itself becomes a motor machine of attack, in other words, a producer of speed. And this is Colombia, February 4, Venezuelan migrants crowded onto a truck as it crossed the Colombian mountains. The economic crisis in Venezuela has set off a staggering exodus. That's Federico Rios Escobar, again for the New York Times. Santiago, Chile, October 29, a burning barricade marked the end of a long day of unrest in the capital. Protests that began over a subway fare rise spiralled into violent clashes between security forces and demonstrators. That's Thomas Minuti, Munita for the New York Times. Again, going back to that article, The New Economy of Anger, I said the phenomenon is spreading like wildfire, in large part because of the tinder dry conditions underfoot. And I said prolonged standoffs eviscerate economies, reducing opportunities and accelerate the negative feedback loop. Let's turn to currency markets, Euro, Dollar, 111.45, Dollar Index, 97.10, Japanese Yen, 109.55, Swiss Franc, 0 0.9830, the pound coming off the boil, 132.56, the Australian Dollar, 0 0.6861, uh, India Rupee, 70.9728, South Korean, 111.6606, the real has strengthened 40635, Egyptian pound has strengthened 160508, and the rand at 14.3859, piercing key resistance at 1450, in what is, I believe, an important breakthrough on the chart. Euro dollar, this is from Rich Frontiers, currently at 111.45. 
and beginning to strengthen. Sterling dropped after two days of gains following reports that the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson will change the law to guarantee the Brexit transition phase isn't extended beyond the end of 2020. Interesting piece in the market here, Netflix cash content spend from Bernstein. Most people think you can't grow subs without spending a lot more on programs and films. If you look at the second chart below, you can see that we disagree. A $20 billion annual spend, they can release a new complete series every day even taking into account foreign language material and a percentage of duds, this feels like enough. 23rd of September, I put out a conviction buy. Netflix was then at 270.75. I quoted uh, annals of uh, technology, streaming dreams. The people went from broad to narrow, and we think they will continue to go that way, spend more and more time in the niches because now the distribution landscape allows for more narrowness. And I was saying there's a blind spot because most of the analysts for Netflix are in the US, but I think it's an international story rather than purely a US story. And therefore, I remain bullish, and I think they've got a great deal more experience in this business than a lot of these Johnny-come-lately competitors. Apple is up 25.5% since the beginning of October. That's from Northman Trader. My article over the weekend was about Saudi Aramco's 1.96 trillion uh, valuation. It's probably around 2 trillion. Um, and I'm saying that it's a singular triumph for the kingdom, the crown prince and his team. It was precisely correct to limit the supply of shares in order to maintain a structure where demand outstrips supply. This is lesson 101 in the business of IPOs. It was precisely correct to sell the shares into strong hands. Your own nationals and sovereign wealth funds from the neighborhood represent strong hands. Um, I had no problem with them affording leverage versus security with a proposed dividend of 3.75%. And I said it would be plain irresponsible to have done anything differently. Why on earth would you sell more shares than the market could absorb uh, into international markets where short sellers would have a boondoggle? So you, and also they catapulted the Tadawul to the seventh biggest exchange in the world. They maintained the value additive side of this transaction by forcing people to buy these shares in Riyadh. So all round, uh, I have to agree with Danilo Onorino, who said it's, this is the Ferrari of the oil companies. And if you want to buy this Ferrari, you need to go to Riyadh. And I said, that's the final overarching point. Gold, 14.78, just shy of that. Crude oil, above 60 now, $60.20. Coffee futures climbed nearly 7% on Monday to 1.3895 a pound, the biggest one-day surge since 2015. Prices have soared a whopping 38% this year and are at a three-year high. There's a panic in the coffee futures market. There's concern that a lot of the farmers who sold their coffee through futures are not going to be able to deliver on the underlying products, which is an interesting outcome. We were in a bear market earlier this year, you will recall. In EM currencies are rallying hard against the dollar, powered by the dovish Fed, dovish ECB, and hopes for benign global growth, no recession, Robin Brooks IIF. Only one outlier to the rally, the Turkish lira, whose underperformance is more noticeable every day. This is a photo from Brazil, September the 8th. A fire reached the Amazon rainforest near the city of Porto Velo. That's Victor Moriana again from the New York Times. Um, the destruction of the Amazon in Brazil has rapidly increased under a new president. 30th of September, I was saying the end is nigh and talking about the feedback loop 
and the risks of dieback where we enter a phase of cascading system collapse. Clearly this is not an ordinary slowdown, it is India's great slowdown where the economy seems headed for the intensive care unit, Subramanian said, this is Asia Times. Indian economy is now experiencing a second wave of the twin balance sheet crisis which is behind what he terms a great slowdown. The first wave of this crisis happened when bank loans extended to steel, power and infrastructure sector companies during the investment boom of 2004 to 2011 turned bad. The second crisis is largely a post-demonetization phenomenon involving non-banking financial companies or shadow banks and real estate firms. After high-value currency notes were banned, considerable amounts of cash made their way to the banks who lent a major part of that to shadow banks. They channeled this money into the real estate sector. At the end of June 2019, the total number of unsold houses and flats in the top eight cities was almost one million, valued at $113 billion or the equivalent to about four years of sales. In some ways, this may have been India's version of the US housing bubble, he argues. The current slowdown they note is worrisome, not only because of GDP growth has slowed to 4.5% in the second quarter of 2019-2020. Even more distressing is the disaggregated data. These indicators suggest the economy's illness is severe. This slowdown seems closer to the 1991 balance of payments crisis. Second quarter growth of 4.5% was propped up by a 15.64% increase in government expenditure. If that component is left out from GDP, the, actual, the economy actually grew only 3.05%. As I wrote on the 2nd of December, economic growth has now fallen for six consecutive quarters. The GDP figure is the weakest recorded under Modi, who first swept to power five years ago promising to take India's economy to new heights and create millions of jobs every year. Have a look at this short clip of Modi on Islamic terrorism and Muslims by Rana Ayub. This is all about the politics of ethnocratic nationalism. Um, few internet outages have lasted as long as the one in Kashmir. It's been more than a hundred days and counting. That's Al Jazeera listening post. Um, the point is that the smartphone is ubiquitous even in the furthest corners of the world. We're all peering at a newsreel, except of course I wrote if you're in Kashmir, which was described by Nehru as the snowy bosom of the Himalayas, and which is currently switched off from the 21st century. India's sensex ignored everything and rose to a record. Sub-Saharan Africa, music to Putin's ears, Russian forces shoot down U.S. drone. The Pentagon has accused Russian troops of targeting one of its surveillance drones close to the Libyan capital of Tripoli last month. The drone was watching on as a battle for control over the city began to unfold. Libya has become a hive of combat drones in the past year. Cheap Turkish and Chinese-made devices are now swarming over the battlefields. Above them loiter larger, more powerful machines controlled by US and French forces. Now advanced Russian drones have joined the fray. It's created a scenario where General Townsend is not just worried about his drones, he's concerned at the impact fresh Russian forces are having on the civil war. With $7.6 billion secured for Africa through the African Development Fund, we hit the dance floor and celebrated. That's Akin Adesina. Highest GDP per capita in current dollars 2018 in Africa, Seychelles 16,433, Mauritius 11,238, 
Equatorial Guinea, 10,174. Botswana, 8,258. Gabon, 8,029. South Africa, 6,374. Namibia, 5,931. Uh, Cabo Verde, 3,654. Angola, 3,432. That's from uh, Mir Thakar. Keeping Ethiopia's transition on the rails, the crisis group clashes in October 29 in Oromia, Ethiopia's most populous region left scores of people dead. They mark the latest explosion of ethnic strife that has killed hundreds and displaced millions across the country over the past year and a half. Four fault lines are especially perilous. The first cuts across Oromia, Abbey's home state, where his rivals and even some former allies believed the Premier should do more to advance the region's interests. The second pits Oromo leaders against those of Amhara, Ethiopia's second most populous state. There are loggerheads over Oromia's bid for greater influence, including over the capital Addis Ababa which is multi-ethnic but surrounded by Oromia. The third relates to a bitter dispute between Amhara politicians and formerly dominant Tigray minority that centers on two territories that the Amhara claim Tigray annexed in the early 1990s. The fourth involves Tigray leaders and Abbey's government with the former resenting the Prime Minister for what they perceive as his dismantling of a political system they constructed and then dominated, and what they see as his lopsided targeting of Tigrayan leaders for past abuses. 14th of October, I, says, I said he faces a fiendishly complicated task, fending off the centripetal forces which are tearing Ethiopia apart. Ethiopia's dollar-denominated sovereign bonds have jumped to the highest since January 2018. The currency hit a fresh record low, of course, that's after the recent announcement of the IMF, part of which was a restructuring uh, transition to a more flexible exchange rate regime. IMF approved a $368 million credit to boost Congo's reserves. This is the first formal IMF loan program since 2012. Congo's international reserves have fallen to critically low levels, creating urgent balance of payment needs. Mary Chiwengwa is to face a charge of attempted murder. She's the wife of Constantine Chiwengwa, the vice president of Zimbabwe. Prosecutors will argue that she tried to kill the vice president, Constantino Chiwengwa, by unplugging life support tubes. You can't make it up. South African all shares up 7.61%. Dollar Rand at 14.3953. Egyptian pound 16.0049. EGX 30 up 2.83% year to date. Nigerian all share down 15.07% year to date. David Pilling dives into the cocoa industry in the African farmers taking on big chocolate. Dressed in a threadbare skirt and purple t-shirt, she dances to her uplifting lyrics. If you want to buy fine cloth, it is cocoa. If you want a meaningful life, it is cocoa. Farmers have been singing variations of this song about how planting cocoa will make you rich for decades in Ghana, the world's largest producer after neighbouring Ivory Coast. In the first decades of the 20th century, smallholders in West Africa rushed into cocoa farming as if it were the new gold. Today, between them, Ghana and Ivory Coast produce nearly two-thirds of the global supply of cocoa, uh, the main ingredient in a chocolate industry worth more than $100 billion a year in sales. Like most of the two million cocoa farmers in West Africa, she is a smallholder and extremely poor. She owns a tiny forest plot from which she harvests just four bags of cocoa beans a year. At last year's prices she would have earned about 300 pounds. Ghana supplies about one-fifth of all cocoa beans for which it earns two billion dollars a year, less than one-fiftieth of the value of the chocolate that is manufactured, branded and sold. Chocolate is a hundred billion dollar industry 
and we who produce 65% of the raw material make less than $6 billion from the sweat and toll of our farmers. This is the President of Ghana. U.S. Labor Department found that the number of children working on cocoa farms, some carrying out dangerous tasks such as spraying pesticide, lugging heavy sacks or wielding machetes, have actually gone up to 2.1 million. Ghana and Ivory Coast unilaterally announced a fixed premium of $400 a ton over the benchmark futures price from October 2020. If you look at OPEC, they're only controlling about 30 to 40 percent of the global oil supply and they control prices. I'm not sure if that's true. If you have OPEC, we can have COPEC. Um, and then talking about the efforts that the likes of Mars, Barry Calibo and others are, made, are, are doing to try and improve livelihoods. Michael Hendricks, a former cocoa executive at commodities trader Archer Daniels Midland, says the attempt by Ghana and Ivory Coast to impose the $400 premium will fail. But campaigners doubt the ability of African governments to influence prices that are determined by traders buying and selling derivative contracts worth some 40 times physical supplies. LID is a bad poker game by people who cannot play poker, he says. He has more radical advice for producers. If they abandon cocoa, prices would go through the roof, grow more food, produce less cocoa and push up the price. Ghana's stock exchange is down 10.43% year to date. Namibia's economy is shrinking. Inflation is at its lowest in 14 years, but because Namibia pegged its currency to the South African rand, if they cut interest rates, investors would shift funds to South Africa. Maseru Lesotho, this is from Truth Slinger. The new acting CEO, Alan Kilavuka, is currently CEO of Kenya Airways' subsidiary Fly Jambo Jet, ahead of them appointing a substantive CEO for Kenya Airways. This is Kenya Debt to GDP. This is from KSCPOG. You can see the trend. Fitch says the general government debt to GDP ratio will continue increasing through 2022 to 64.8% before easing gradually to 60.5% by 2028. Our projections are less optimistic than those of the government which sees debt stabilizing in 2020 and falling to 54% by 2024. Uh, general government debt reached 61.3% of GDP at end 2019, they said. They also warned that Kenya spent twice as much as its peers in paying for loans with the government's interest costs at 22.1%. City Hall, for every one shilling raised in the three months to September, Two shillings and 13 cents was spent on paying employees. Now, Nairobi All Share is up 13.63% this year, and the NSE 20 is down 8.81% this year. Thank you for stopping by.